Dr. Jivanova is a physician, ex-Army and Medical Corps officer and an IIM Bangalore alumnus. Dr. Jivanova has studied the relationship between the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to provide universal, equitable health care and how progress since the Alma-Ata Declaration, which is the origin of the concept of health for all, has been slow. First of all, uh, thanks for having me uh, as part of this webinar. And uh, I would say that uh, I was pretty excited uh, about the concept because all these years uh, we have been hearing about the sustainable development goals. And uh, if I compare this with the startup world, uh, it is something similar to what we call as the zero to one journey. But when I heard from uh, the Thrive team, uh, the endeavor to go beyond sustainability is a stage called as thrivability. So I think that concept uh, kind of stuck to my mind. And uh, hence, it's indeed a pleasure to be a part of this uh, webinar. And uh, over the next 30, May, uh, 30 minutes, my uh, endeavor is to walk you through the journey of uh, uh, especially primary healthcare and why SDG amongst the 17 sustainable and development goals uh, is critical and how an integrated approach helps in this endeavor of moving from sustainability to thrivability. So in, in today's talk, uh, I'm going to cover most of the topics in three different buckets. First, I'm going to talk about why health for all? Why is this an important mission? And how did this start in the first place? After that, we would actually go into the Sustainable Development Goal 3, uh, Good Health and Well-Being, and why non-communicable disorders plays a critical role in, in this entire SDG 3. And then we move on to how we should not just stop at sustainability, but how do we make this mental shift? Uh, all the policymakers, the government, scientists, physicians, and everybody together should look at thrivability. So, Starting on with health for all, uh, this is not a, a relatively new concept. In fact, the origin goes back to the 1978's Almayata Declaration, because till then, uh, most of the programs were focused on a specific uh, disease. And uh, with two, three decades, most of the governments uh, realized that they were failing in, in controlling these large healthcare programs. And one of the key tenets of uh, the health for all or uh, the Alma Atta declaration was to look at primary healthcare as one of the key concepts by involving the communities and, and then using appropriate technologies, how we can get all the nations uh, with an endeavor back then by 2000, can we uh, achieve health for all. So that is how the origin of health for all and today uh, it has also shaped up as uh, universal healthcare or equitable healthcare. And uh, I'll, I'll just walk you through how the journey has been. So this is what uh, I was talking about. Uh, if you look at from 1948 to 78, uh, these were mostly disease specific programs uh, that's when I think uh, research has had started connecting the dots between cancers, uh, use of tobacco, how environmental factors played a role in some of the chronic respiratory diseases. But as I mentioned, probably the disease specific uh, efforts were not working well. That is how the next uh, endeavor uh, was to look at a spectrum of uh, diseases involving the common modifiable risk factors and this endeavor from 1978 till 2000 uh, saw a shift in identifying a spectrum of, of uh, disorders. Uh, again, NCDs uh, kind of were a significant uh, set of uh, diseases here. And if you look at probably three to four decades ago, the communicable disorders like malaria, tuberculosis, uh, these were uh, some of the biggest killers. Whereas 
after the industrial revolution we started seeing an emergence of lifestyle disorders or what are commonly now called as the non communicable disorders now around 2000 to 2008 uh, the focus uh, shifted to tackling some of the underlying common uh, risk factors and when we talk about non communicable disorders it it basically covers the entire spectrum of cardio respiratory disorders so just to give you a perspective uh, we lose about 43 million patients every year across the globe due to non communicable disorders and uh, in these the cardiac and respiratory disorders uh, contribute the majority of them we have diabetes hypertension copd asthma and cancers and some of the underlying risk factors are common and the focus was on targeting the uh, ncds and some of the intervention measures were around reducing the use of tobacco alcohol uh, how do you focus on moving to healthy diets and also uh, how do you reduce the physical inactivity now while the goal was uh, to achieve healthcare for all by 2000 now fast forward and we are at 2022 and this is the stark reality at least half of the world's population still lacks access to essential healthcare services and the irony is uh, it's not about the developed countries and the low and middle income countries what is more surprising is your zip code or pin code carries more weightage on the potential health out- outcomes than your genetic code hence uh, who uh, came up with these factors which are called as the social determinants of health like where you are born where you grow where you live work and your age contributes more to the potential health outcomes than your genetic code and the disparities are stark open in front of your eyes so if you look at covid-19 deaths uh, you would see that 94% of the covid-19 deaths in european union were in the age group of more than uh, 60 years and people in low and middle income countries have a statistics that when you compare with the developed nations they almost live about 18.1 years lesser compared to the other part of the world and when i talk about disparity this is not about comparing a developed economy with a low and middle income countries this is very much if i take the example in us in chicago this is from uh, a hims uh, report which i was going through last week in the same city of chicago downtown where the the per capita income is something above 100000 and about two metro stations further south where the the per capita income for a family is just about 25000 and within probably the most developed country about two metro st- uh, stations away there is health disparity and the possible outcome now i i think this is something which we all have grown up hearing health is wealth now if you look at the covid pandemic it it serves as a myth. the uh, global uh, extreme poverty rate uh for the first time fell uh in in about uh, 20 years and about 100 million patient 100 million population kind of moved into extreme poverty so the pandemic further exposed and and uh, intensified the inequalities we have all seen how probably when the vaccines were launched it's not that the entire globe Uh, with the seven plus billion population, we are able to access vaccine at the same time. Now, it's a very well-known fact when the pharmaceutical companies launch any new drug, 
be it in oncology or respiratory or for any cardiovascular uh, diseases. It's usually launched first in the US and, and then around the same time, probably we, we see the launch in Europe and probably what I would call as Japan or JPAC. And then probably after four to five years, it, it comes uh, into what we call as the emerging markets. Now, when you compare probably the launch of Apple iPhone or any other new technology, we don't see this lag. Probably around the same time that a product is launched in US or Europe, we almost see the same product in India and if not all the countries, at least in most nations, even in the emerging markets. So why not the same for health? This is an uh, interesting question in, in today's digital world. Why do we still see this lag? Now, hence, we really have to look at the concept of health for all or universal health care as a starting point to improve the health and well-being of populations around the world. Now, what is universal health care and, and how does it work? These are some uh, three examples. Usually, it's, it's a single payer like we see in the National Health Services or NHS of UK. It's, it's a free government provided healthcare paid by the uh, taxes uh, of, of the citizens. Or uh, for example, in, in Germany, it's a mandatory insurance where the government runs the health insurance, uh, again, financed by the payroll tax of employers or employees. And, and the third example is, is a mix of pub, publicly funded and privately delivered, like in Canada, where every citizen pays into a national plan. Now, just to summarize on the first section, uh, I spoke about the concept of health for all. It goes back to 1978 as, as part of the Alma Ata Declaration. And the endeavor was to achieve the health for all goal by 2000 and the stark reality, 50% of today's population still lacks essential healthcare services. Now, during the trans transition of these development goals from the millennium development goals, it got transitioned to the sustainable development goals. And today I'm going to touch upon the impact of COVID-19 and stay focused around the sustainable development goal three, which is good health and well-being. Now, probably this is the first uh, pandemic which kind of impacted the entire globe. And what we saw a phenomena for the first time, like all of us were physically isolated, but socially connected during this pandemic. And as I again emphasize, when we look at how it impacted these three sustainable development goals, statistics say like due to this pandemic, almost close to a hundred million people are pushed into extreme poverty. Uh, these are updated uh, statistics. And natural disasters force almost 26 million into poverty every year. And, and Morris also just mentioned, uh, if you see the news reports on flash floods, hurricanes, cyclones, these have become much more common in, in the last few years. When we talk about the, the second goal or, or the threat to food systems, most of the small scale food producers were, were hit hard. Now, while we all know that the entire IT industry or people working in the technology industry had the comfort, I would say a relatively comfortable situation of working from home and probably getting their monthly salaries. But this was not the case for everybody across the table. So, so this is where almost 40 to 85% of the small scale food producers hit, were hit hard due to the pandemic. And also we saw multiple impact of 
COVID on the existing healthcare programs. What they probably also report, like almost 53% of 129 countries, and this we are talking about where data is available. There are still so many countries where you don't have robust data, had severe disruption to the childhood immunization programs. Now, some of the other uh, effects due to the pandemic uh, is, is not just COVID, but what we have seen is this spike in communicable diseases, illness and deaths like malaria. And also one of the statistic which is used in the public health, measuring the infant and maternal mortality, what they say is like, the under five deaths has increased substantially because of pandemic. Now, this brings us to an, an interesting question. Should we look at SDG3 or the good health and well-being as an isolated goal? Or is there a link between different SDGs and let's say, for example, climate change? So these are few examples which uh, I would like to share how climate change and SDGs are interconnected. Now, every year with the increase in temperature and the warmer cli climates, it's directly resulting in the increase of breeding grounds for vectors of, of communicable uh, diseases. Now, we have seen the outbreaks of Nipah virus, Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya. And if you see in the last decade or so, the incidences have uh, increased significantly, causing disruption in, in different parts of the world. Now, the, the second aspect is climate change can also increase the prevalence of waterborne diseases. And Reports again say here, almost half a million children die each year due to these waterborne diseases. And we all are very well aware of the carbon emissions and the impact of uh, air pollution. Just in US alone, about 200,000 premature deaths happen directly due to the uh, air pollution. So, I, I think it's the responsibility of not just the policymakers, but all groups who can influence to, to look at the natural synergies between healthcare needs and the climate change effort, uh, effort effects. Now, I, I spoke about uh, some of these examples, again, how uh, COVID-19 impacted the SDGs. Uh, almost a, a decade of progress uh, we had seen pretty good progress in, in the infant and maternal mortality rates, but due to COVID, probably all the work which was done in the last 10 years probably kind of got reversed. Now, some of the other disruptions in the supply chain, upscaling of healthcare workers, just to give you some statistics, probably in, in North America, where we have about 150 nurses or midwives, allied healthcare professionals for every 10,000 people. The shortage before pandemic was about 10 professionals per 10,000 people in the sub-Saharan Africa. And, and all of these got further uh, aggravated due to the pandemic. So this brings uh, to, to an interesting point during COVID, we have seen the importance of primary and preventive health care. While everybody was uh, waiting for the vaccines and the medicines specific to COVID-19 uh, being, being researched and, and launched, so we had the good old preventive measures like the hand wash, mask, and, and the use of sanitizers, which probably also wouldn't cost so much compared to the pharmacotherapy or the vaccines. 
and while the scientists across the world uh, in a record time came up with vaccines but as the first line of defense probably in the early months the good old primary and preventive care steps uh, kind of helped uh, people uh, stay safe from the impact of COVID-19. Now, this is what brings me to the uh, next section of, of my talk, which is on compounding capacities. Now, I'd like to quote a few examples. We, during pandemic, we saw a, a huge rush to kind of supply the oxygen concentrators or the ventilators. And even the most developed countries didn't have space in the ICUs. So one of the biggest drawbacks in healthcare is to understand the importance of the healthcare workers or the manpower and the uh, upskilling of these staff. Because ventilators or oxygen concentrators or medical devices and equipments on their own don't treat diseases. Healthcare is a manpower intensive industry. Hence, it's, it's important to understand the concept of upskilling the healthcare workers. While we have probably hundreds and thousands of medical schools, the frontline staff might be a nurse or allied healthcare worker, all play a crucial role in controlling the pandemic. Hence, I, I talk about the compounding capacity. Now, what does this mean? Probably one of the, uh, not exactly advantages, but prob probably a silver lining, what I would call uh, the outcome of pandemic was that it expedited the adoption of digital initiatives in healthcare, in pharma and, and medtech industry. And technology adoption, especially when we talk of telemedicine, telehealth, remote monitoring and follow-up, which has been around for the last four or five decades, but there were always question marks about the adoption. And probably the work done in two to three decades was all expedited in the last one or two years. And why this is critical? Because having the fundamental infrastructure at the primary healthcare network, improving access through the digital health technologies, not only bridges the gap for access, but it's, it's also affordable and creates an analytical foundation for disease surveillance. So for the first time, we saw that more than the doctors or the scientists, pandemic kind of brought healthcare information through news channels, social media. The patients were pretty much as aware or more aware than the healthcare professionals, I, I would say. So building this digital infrastructure was one of the positive outcomes of the pandemic. Now, I spoke about the role of community health workers. Coming from India, I can say, if, if India probably did a good job in, in covering its 1.35 billion population with, with vaccines, it was thanks to the, the previous work done by the community healthcare workers in driving large vaccination campaigns for polio. Most of that infrastructure was there and I think it was quickly adopted to meet the requirements of the pandemic. So when we look at statistics, uh, I, I spoke about NCDs causing 43 million deaths every year across the globe. But a starking difference, uh, almost 70 to 80% of these deaths actually happen in the low and middle income countries in the age group of 15 to 60. And why this statistic is important, because when NCDs strike a person in this age group, which is considered to be 
economically the most profound uh, segment when you actually go to work you are the breadwinner for the family and when a disease strikes in this age group it not only brings down that individual but it takes that entire family down the poverty line and it's important to note that while these account for 67% of deaths only 1% of the global health funding is dedicated to preventing and treating ncds hence i i emphasize on the need for foundational investments that communities can build over time to create resilient systems now what i mean by this the covin vaccination platform which was developed by india probably was also offered to quite a few other countries and this can continue to be used for multiple other public health campaigns the telehealth network called e sanjeevini which was launched by the indian government uh, which which saw almost more than 20 plus million consultations done uh in the first 3 to 6 months itself gives a ray of hope to provide this access and coverage for many other public health programs as well that's how i i would like to emphasize the role of uh, investment in the primary health care with the aim to achieve universal health care by involving communities now these are again couple of examples uh when we were hit with the the first and second wave the indian government came up with his own application called arogya setu now i'm i'm just trying to give these statistics and examples still about 600 to 700 million of indians probably would not have access to a smartphone they would probably not know how to talk in english so when i talk of disparities within the same countries so there's still a huge divide between the urban rural so we launched in in about 3 to 6 months of of the first wave a covid screening and triage tool which could be used by the blue collared workers or or their families those who don't have a smartphone and probably can't talk english so i would like to emphasize in healthcare having that human connect is hugely uh, important because technologies do not empathize with the patient unfortunately technology has not yet advanced to a stage where they can feel the pain or feel empathized towards this patients hence in most of these large scale projects that we implemented one of the learnings was to have the human in loop connection for most of these programs so the hybrid frameworks which worked much better where there is a combination of digital and human involvement so with with these examples i would like to move to the next section of my talk on why there is a need for an integrated approach to tackle ncds across the sdgs now i have already covered some of these statistics but probably for the first time in in so many decades we we have a, a report watch what who calls as the best buys to tackle uh, ncds and and this project came up with interesting metrics to quantify and measure the investment done to tackle non communicable disorders and what is the return on investment so these statistics point out that the cumulative lost output due to ncds in in just the low and middle income countries between 2011 to 2025 would be a whopping 7 trillion whereas the 
investment needed to implement a set of high impact cost effective interventions is just around 11.2 billion and i will further cover some of these points in in this next slide what i was referring to as the who best buys so what are these best buys these these are basically a set of interventions that are probably well researched and proven to be affordable cost effective and evidence based so implementing these kind of indicate that for every 1 dollar invested in the handling of uh, ncds will give a return of about 7 dollars by 2030 and these best buy interventions cover around six policy areas the use of tobacco alcohol the impact of unhealthy diet the role of physical inactivity and the management of cardiovascular disease diabetes and cancers so there are 16 targeted interventions which demonstrate the best evidence of generating impact and and value for health economy and the other areas of national development hence we should look at tackling non communicable disorders under the sdg3 umbrella not specific to that goal itself but as an integrated approach which impacts other sdgs as well now these are uh, some statistics which i covered which go into further details to explain how focusing on these best buy interventions would result in a 15% reduction in premature mortality which could be achieved by 2030 and this could result in saving at least 8.2 million lives and the same set of interventions would prevent over 17 million cases of ischemic heart disease and stroke by 2030 in low and middle income countries and not to talk about the impact on the economic growth which is uh, around us 350 billion dollars now why i keep focusing on ncds and low middle income countries just to bring you a perspective because i am from india and to cover 1.35 billion population we just have 4000 cardiologists imagine 4000 cardiologists to take care of 1.35 billion population whereas the need is for close to 100000 cardiologists and probably the statistics would almost be the same in in most of these low and middle income countries we might have hundreds of medical schools and doctors but without having a robust primary and preventive health care the community level health care allied staff there is no way we can tackle the ncds and uh, sdg goals by 2030 so this gives a clear correlation between the socio socio economic parameters and why an integrated approach is important to tackle the ncds and sdg3 now just to touch upon what are these 16 interventions again these go into further details how to reduce the tobacco use through tax uh, and having prominent advertisements on the packages enforcing policies on smoke free public places educating the masses and and the same goes for the reduction of harmful use of alcohol and how to incentivize the population to get more physically active while we have the 10000 walk or steps campaigns probably i can share one or two examples probably the uh, singapore government when i i was there a couple of years back i've seen in in most of the community living they incentivize the elders 
they have given some smart watches or digital watches uh, and based on the number of steps they take and they hit the target it's it's linked to their access to certain healthcare policies so quite a few countries are uh, adopting such measures and but we need more of them and continuing with the 16 intervention areas again reducing unhealthy diet by having the proper labeling and awareness on on the packaging and managing cardiovascular disease and diabetes having the annual checks screening and targets for for the clinical parameters expanding the network of screening for cancers so these are uh, some of the uh, interventions which is part of the who best buy so i think just to summarize what i have tried to do in today's webinar is to connect the dots between three themes and my endeavor is that when you kind of log off from from this webinar to take home three broad pointers the cost of preventive healthcare is always going to be optimum and better compared to the cost of curative care or what we see the emphasis on hospital based healthcare delivery so we have to invest heavily in building a robust primary healthcare hence the first section i spoke on the concept of health for all which has been there from 1978 and has been evolving towards the universal healthcare and equitable healthcare second i spoke about the sustainable development goal 3 and why tackling ncds would have a major impact on this specific goal and the third section which brought me to this webinar was the concept of moving from sustainability to thrivability because most of these five year 10 year plans always seem to be getting postponed in perpetuity hence we need to have a huge mind shift from thinking just not about sustainability but making a huge mind shift into thrivability thanks a lot